The Hayes Advantage with Kathleen Hayes and Bonnie Quinn. We want to get right to our next guest. We are thrilled to have him on the show today. It has been too long. Ron Paul, of course, is the U.S. representative, Republican U.S. representative from Texas, Texas 14th Congressional District. He is also in the race to win the Republican nomination for the presidency. Ron Paul is a longtime critic of the Federal Reserve, a big hearing in, ye- in Washington yesterday where he got six different proposals for reforming, even perhaps abolishing the Fed, and we're just delighted to have him back on the show today. Congressman Paul, welcome. Thank you, Kathleen. Good to be with you. So for starters, uh, you know, you got these six different proposals presented, as well as your proposal to abolish the Fed outright. Do any of these proposals or any other ones stand out as good alternatives to the central bank's current structure or mandate? Or is it your view that the only solution is ending the Fed entirely? <laughs> well, of course, I'd have to be biased in that, in that direction. I don't think anything is going to happen immediately. But I think just your introduction sort of emphasized something I think is important, is the fact that we're talking this much about it. How many many years ago when you wouldn't have a single proposal, and now we have six, actually there's a couple more, and and there's a lot of overlapping. So I think the debate is amazing, and the interest expressed in the monetary issue in the Federal Reserve is a fascination for me, and I think also very important. Most of the discussion yesterday ended up talking about, you know, whether or not we should have a dual mandate and what is the makeup of the FOMC and whether it should be larger and how it should be appointed. Uh, Of course, I was trying to guide the debate more into monetary policy and fiat money and backing of currency and why we have a business cycle. But I thought all in all, it was a very productive day because uh, we talked about something I consider very important. Well, are you completely in favor of a totally unmanaged economy then or what is your prescription? Well, you know, in history, there's been plenty of times when uh, our country, as well as other countries, didn't operate on a central bank. Uh, right now, of course, the conventional wisdom is that they, nobody can even conceive of it because it's been a long time since anybody operated with a central bank. So, yes, uh, the free market people work on the assumption that you don't have to have a central bank. A central bank overall is, causes more mischief than help. It does destroy the value of the currency. We've had ours for 100 years, and uh, it's lost about 98% of its value in purchasing power. And so we see it as a, as a detriment, uh, and that is why we argue the case that it would be better not to have a central bank. But we also, in one of my bills, it's a transition where we just uh, introduce a high uh, principle of uh, competing currencies and just get rid of the legal tender laws and let people operate with another currency and this gives some people protection, and, and there's, uh, there's no uh, rapid change. If people don't want to use an alternative currency, they can save all their money and put all their money in the bank and, and hope the Federal Reserve note maintains value. But uh, if you could guarantee savings in terms of, uh, of gold or silver, and uh, that would be the backing of the currency, people, I think, should have that option. Uh, well, uh, Congressman Paul, uh are you concerned that uh, if, if you uh, depart from Congress, from your chairmanship of the subcommittee that oversees the Fed, if you, you know, don't win the presidency, for example, would this halt some of the momentum to change the Fed that, it, that has occurred over the past four years? Or do you have a plan to keep the pressure up? Well, if it does, that means I haven't or the movement isn't strong enough. But, you know, last year we did pass my bill in the House – Every Republican supported it, and we still have a lot of, on, on this year. But uh, that didn't come from me, you know, because I'm not a full committee chairman. I have no really legislative clout. It came from the grassroots. Of course, we energized the grassroots, and they called their congressman, and they said, look, this is an important issue. Get on it. So I think that's going to exist, and being in Congress or not, I'll probably still – work to promote these ideas. And as time goes on, I think it's going to be more necessary. I've been talking about this for a long time, but the dramatic difference occurred, you know, uh, after, the, after the crunch came in in 08, because all of a sudden people realized uh, how big of an issue this was. And then they found out that the Fed acted in secrecy, and they found out that the Fed bailed out a lot of, a lot of banks and a lot of special businesses. And this has gotten the attention of so many people, and I'm deeply encouraged, especially because I visit the college campuses and the young people, 
are fascinated with the issue of money, and now they've come okay. around to thinking how important it is. Are you considering pushing for having abolition of the Fed as a plank of the Republican platform in Tampa? Oh, no, not really. I mean, that's that's my position, but I'm also a little bit realistic, you know, about that. I think the practical thing, though, would be to uh, get more uh, transparency of the Fed. Most people have trouble arguing against that. I think like 80% of the American people say, yeah, Congress should know a little bit more about the well, Fed. But, they, but they, pe- they publish their their uh, forecasts now on the economy and the Fed <laughs> funds rate. They've moved, moved toward a lot more transparency. Yeah, but it's pretty hard to find out what their international transactions are. And, you know, when the bailouts came, uh, there was churning of trillions and trillions of dollars worth of, of credit. And foreign banks and foreign central banks and governments benefited by this. And we're just getting a little bit of that information out now. So... No, there's a lot to to be known about what the Fed is is doing, and uh, and this is the reason why I think because we've had a little bit of this knowledge. This is why I think there's six bills out there saying that we should, uh, you know, maybe curtail the Fed. They're talking about taking away this mandate they deal with unemployment, which is to to me a little bit of a fictitious issue. But anyway, they're responding to this idea that Congress should have more oversight and and uh, restrain the Fed to some degree. I think it was Johnny Blanchflower that said that nobody ever gets any credit for solving a hypothetical problem, though. And, you know, we will never know what would have happened if the Fed had not been able to engage in some form of correction, correcting the economy. Are you saying that the Fed, had it not existed, that we would be in the same situation that we're in now in terms of our economic crisis? In terms no, of we'd, be, we'd, be much, we'd be much better off because what they've done is delayed it. And it is not a hypothetical situation because what you could do is look at the crisis of 1920-21, the, the predictable uh, recession. It was called a depression then from the inflation of World War I. The, there was a total hands-off position. The Fed didn't believe in it. The Congress didn't believe in it. Very, very sharp downturn. It was over in a year. So we would be over all this if the uh, bad debt had been liquidated or the bankruptcies have occurred and bought up the good debt. Instead, we transferred all the bad debt into directly or indirectly into the hands of the uh, taxpayer. So the Fed owns all this tax, all this uh, mortgage debt, and they don't know how to unwind it. So it's sitting there. Okay. That's one thing that came out yesterday. Nobody's interested or knows how they'll ever unwind uh, that monetary base. Not, yeah, but Congressman Paul, a couple of questions on, on the race for the Republican nomination. Uh, you're still in it. How much longer are you going to stay? What's it going to take for you to say this is it? Well, I guess or, until the until the race is over. Um, I mean, right now we're starting to get people to recognize that we actually uh, had been doing much better than they they would admit before. Because now, when the delegates are being picked, they're finding out that we're winning some of these states. So, uh, you know, as far as a, a, a PR result, if we'd have had that all occurring, you know, when Iowa was voted on, now we're we may well carry those Iowa. Those delegates get seated, though, Congressman. That's that's one of the questions, right? Oh, our our people will be seated, but some of them won't be allowed to vote for me on the first go around. But since we're in this for two reasons: first, to win; the second, to change the debate, uh, there will be a lot of people there, hundreds, who will be Ron Paul supporters, and uh, we'll, we'll have an influence and we'll have okay. an impact. Speaking of that, if you can capture five caucus states, one of my colleagues in Washington points out you have greater standing at the convention. Assuming you succeed, what do you want? Oh, I don't personally want anything. I just want to have people know what the problems are in this country and to address them. Uh, one of the, I go to the campuses. The message is very well received there. I want them to talk about foreign policy, and I want them to talk about monetary policy and how, how ridiculous it is for us to borrow uh, so much money and have this debt out of control. Congressman Ron Paul, thank you so very much for taking time out of a very busy day. Thank you for having me. You can listen to The Hayes Advantage weekdays at 1230 Eastern on Bloomberg 1130 in New York or on Sirius and XM Satellite Radio Channel 113. Copyright 2012, Bloomberg LP.